All right, hello class, welcome back. And this is Professor Watson, uh, LGLA 1351 Contracts. This is our second recording on chapter eight. Uh, today we're talking about the statute of frauds. We're talking about that, uh, that specific law that says these certain types of contracts have to be in writing in order to be enforceable, okay? Um, we spent one whole lecture talking about the statute of frauds generally, talking about that it is, um, you know, that it's the kind of thing that can that, that can defeat otherwise enforceable contracts. It can take contracts that the parties meant to be enforceable. They intended for them to be enforceable. They're, they would be enforceable under any other rules of contract, um, but then take those and say, but the court's not going to enforce it just because you didn't put it in writing. And that's kind of a harsh remedy, okay? And, or kind of a harsh result. And so as a result, um, the, the courts typically, they narrowly construe that contract. They only enforce it by the very letter of the law, generally. They don't expand it. They don't, they don't try to make things covered by the, the statute of frauds. In fact, just the opposite. If there's a reason to take something out of the statute of frauds, to say that, no, the statute of frauds doesn't apply to this type of contract, then the courts are likely to do it. Um, they're also likely to look for, for any reason to meet those elements, right? Um, the elements are you have to have uh, the essential terms have to be in writing and signed by the party to be charged. Um, what kind of writing? Well, nearly any writing, the back of a cocktail napkin will do. 37 different emails and an email thread will do. Um, a, a contract napkin and an email and 16 tweets um, and a letter, all of those kind of things will do. Um, as long as they're signed by the party to be charged. Or even a writing that was created later, an acknowledgement, right? Hey, I, I acknowledge we had a contract, even if they didn't intend to acknowledge it. Um, even if they're like, ha, 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 remember that contract we had and here's the terms? That's not enforceable. Signed Jeremy. That's got the essential terms and it's signed by the party to be charged. That might be a sufficient acknowledgement because um, the court's going to construe the statute of frauds very narrowly. Um, in this second lecture, though, let's talk about the specific categories of the statute of fraud. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, specific categories of contracts that are covered by the statute of frauds. OK, um, this is where law students all start rolling their eyes. First of all, we had all those exceptions and all those. Well, you know, um, um, equitable remedies could still apply even if it doesn't meet the statute of frauds. Right. We talked about that. Um, well, any number of writings could, could satisfy the statute of frauds. We talked about that. Uh, but memorizing the categories that the statute of frauds applies to, um, that's another one that, that, that usually uh, um, uh, gets everybody down. But it's not hard. It's not hard if you just remember the categories. And your book gives you that mnemonic device, that, that device to help you remember my legs, M-Y-L-E-G-S, six letters, um, there's typically six different categories of, of contracts the statute of frauds applies to. In fact, one of them, uh, the E in my legs we're going to talk about, um, I don't even think you really need to remember that one um, because the E in my legs is really pretty similar to the S in my legs. Um, and so when it comes to E, um, I don't really think you need to memorize it. Um, uh, in fact, you don't have to memorize any of them because uh, it's a statute. The statute of frauds is really a statute. You can always go look up the statute yourself. You can always read the categories, um, but it's important to get familiar so that if you have a contract that touches on one of these areas, you go, aha, wait a minute. I need to go check the statute of frauds because this one may need to be in writing uh, in order to be enforceable, right? And if you're, what's the, re what, what's the purpose of entering into a contract if it's not going to be enforceable? Um, then you just got a handshake deal and, and you hope the other side complies. Uh, so let's look at the categories of things that have to be in writing in order to satisfy the statute of frauds. All right. Let's see if I can share my screen with you again. All right. My legs. Um, when we're looking at my legs, the, uh, the M in my legs stands for marriage. Marriage is the first category. What are we talking about? Well, Contracts, uh, the, the typical way it's, it's phrased is contracts in anticipation of marriage. Uh, does that mean if I'm getting married, I have to have a contract? No, 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 no. But it means that, that contracts that, that really turn on the existence or non-existence of a marriage, right? Or the, 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 the um, contracts that, that are formed in anticipation of marriage. Um, 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 
must be in writing to be enforceable, okay? Uh, so it, this does not apply to a promise to marry, right? A promise to marry, uh, typically in the United States these days, that's not enforceable. Other, uh, other countries maybe, uh, but a contract to marry, probably not enforceable in the United States, even if it is in writing. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about those promises that are, are related to or premised on the existence of a marriage, okay? So... Things like prenuptial agreements, okay? Prenuptial agreements, or even antinuptial, or we might call them postnuptial agreements. What, what's the difference between a prenuptial and a postnuptial agreement? Well, a, a prenuptial agreement is an agreement in anticipation of marriage, right? It's, it's an agreement that you make before marriage about how, uh, you know, we're getting married, but just in case things go wrong, how are we going to split our estate up? after we get divorced, right? That's a pre-nuptial agreement. Nuptial, uh, pre-before nuptial marriage. Um, so a pre-nuptial agreement is an agreement you enter into before marriage about how are we gonna split up our assets if our marriage falls apart, right? So that's the kind of contract in anticipation of marriage we're talking about. A contract that depends on the existence of the marriage. A post-nuptial or anti-nuptial agreement would be very similar. That's just one of those agreements that, you're, that you enter into after marriage. So uh, you didn't have a prenup, but now you're married, and, and now you know you want to enter into an agreement like that after you're married, you can still do it. It's just called an anti-nuptial or post-nuptial agreement. Or um, if you had a prenuptial agreement, and then after you got married, you decided you wanted to amend it, right? Uh, people still might call that a prenuptial agreement, but if you amended it after you're married, then now it's actually an antinuptial or postnuptial agreement, right? Because you entered into it after you were married. Do people really do that? Sure, they do, right? Um, um, take Donald Trump and, and uh, Melania, right? Uh, I don't know if they have a prenup or not. It would make perfect sense for them to, and of course, all of the rumors are that they had a prenuptial agreement before they were married, and that when Donald Trump decided to run for president, um, uh, that uh, Moana um, decided that she wanted to, uh, before she was going to uh, sign off on that, she wanted to adjust that agreement some, right? So they had a prenup before they got married. After they got married, they amended it, or maybe they even entered into a new agreement. That would be a post-nuptial agreement. Either way, that contract revolves around the fact that they're either married or not, right? Um, and so that contract has to be in writing. Do not be confused. Um, a contract with a wedding caterer or hiring a DJ or um, renting a venue. Sure, um, it's easy to say, well, those are anticipation of marriage. I don't need the venue. I don't need the wedding dress. I don't need the cake or the caterer if I'm not getting married. That's not the kind of contracts we're talking about, okay? We're talking about contracts that, that for their purpose, uh, depend on the existence or non-existence of a marriage, like prenup and postnuptial or antenuptial agreements, all right? So my legs... Um, these are the categories of contracts that must be in assigned writing in order to be enforceable. And the very first one, M in my legs, is marriage. Contracts in anticipation of marriage. Um, whoops. Um, all right, what about Y? Um, y stands for year, okay? So if M is for marriage, Y is for year. Uh, year means contracts that are not to be performed within one year, okay? Contracts which are not to be performed in one year. Um, now, remember, we talked about the statute of frauds uh, being applied very narrowly by courts generally, okay? And so uh, this is one of those categories where um, the courts are gonna read this one very carefully and very strictly, okay? Um, why only applies if there is no way the contract can be completed within one year, all right? Doesn't matter if the parties anticipate it talking, um, taking longer than one year. Doesn't matter if it actually takes longer than one year. What matters is, can it be completed? I mean, not breached, but actually completed within one year. And if that's a possibility, then courts may use that to say, to, to, take, to take a contract out of the statute of frauds, to say that the statute of frauds does not apply. Let me give you an example. Um, we sign a contract. Uh, um, uh, I need to have a new bridge built. Um, and I, I'm the government. And so I sign a, I sign a contract with a uh, construction contractor to build a bridge. And we anticipate that this is going to take about three years. Uh, does that contract need to be in writing? And the answer is no. 
Not necessarily, not under why anyway, because while we might anticipate it taking longer than one year, can it be completed in one year? And the answer is sure. They could hire every construction worker in the United States, right? They could, they could buy every bit of concrete and steel and every bit of every crane and every bulldozer in the country, and they could get that bridge built in less than one year. And so if it is even a theoretical possibility that it can be completed within one year, then the statute of frauds does not apply, okay? Um, uh, it is uh, currently March, 2024. Um, and so if I decide that uh, my birthday is in June, and of course that's coming up too early for this year, but let's say um, uh, uh, Taylor Swift and Travis Kels, uh, uh, Kelsey, they seem to be all the rage these days. And so I decide I really want to see if I can get, uh, um, um, really want to see if I can get Taylor Swift at my birthday party. She can't do it in 2024. Um, so I see if I can get her there for 2025. And she says, yeah, I will appear at your birthday party in June of 2025 for five minutes. I'm going to show up. I'm going to do one song and I'm going to leave. You're going to owe me $10 million. Um, and I'm like, wow, yes, Taylor Swift at my birthday party. Five minutes is worth every bit of $10 million. And so I enter into a contract with Taylor Swift. Um, does that have to be in writing? The answer is yes. Um, and you say, but, but she's only going to be there five minutes. Uh, that's not a year. Yeah. But we've specifically contracted that she's going to be at my birthday in June of 2025. And that is more than one year from now. So she can't possibly complete that contract within one year because the performance is more than one year from now, even though she's only going to be there for five minutes, okay? So, um, so when we talk about this category, why? Contracts not to be performed within one year. We look at, is there any possibility that the contract can be completed according to its terms, can meet its essential purpose within one year? Taylor Swift sings at my birthday this year for five minutes. Absolutely. Taylor Swift sings at my birthday in 2025. Not going to make it. Even if she's only there for five minutes, we can't complete that within one year because that's more than one year away. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, let's say that I have a radio station and I've decided I'm going to try to hire away uh, Howard Stern and I'm going to pay him a million dollars this year and I'll pay him. Um, uh, I'm going to hire him for life. Uh, for life or for the next 10 years. And I'm going to pay him a million dollars this year and his salary will go up a million dollars every year he's with the company. Uh, does that have to be in writing? The answer is what? No, because that contract could be completed within one year. Um, I've, hired, uh, um, um, I've hired Howard Stern for life, um, for life or for 10 years. Uh, is there a chance Howard Stern could die in less than a year? Sure there is, right? But what if he died in 11 months? Then has he breached the contract? No. Have I breached the contract by not continuing to pay him? No. The contract is completed because he died within one year. That takes it out of the statute of frauds. That contract would not have to be in writing, at least not under why, all right? So if there's any chance that a contract can be completed within one year, then that takes it out of the statute of frauds. Um, but if there is no chance, if a contract is absolutely going to take more than one year, even if Taylor Swift only has to perform for five minutes, she can't finish that performance in less than a year um, because it's more than a year from now when she's required to do it, then it is covered by uh, the statute of frauds. It is covered by why? Because it can't be completed within one year, okay? Um, all right, so my legs. M is for contracts in anticipation of marriage. Y is for contracts not to be performed within one year. Um, L in my legs is for land or contracts involving real property, okay? Um, a promise to transfer, typically, a promise to transfer any interest in land is required to be in writing, in a signed writing, right? In a, in, in a writing that would satisfy the statute of frauds. Um, so um, that's a big one, right? Anytime you are dealing with a contract that has anything to do with real estate, you need to be thinking, do I need this contract to be in writing? Because most of the time, if you have a contract involving real property, uh, the contract has to be in writing. Now, um, recognize that it is a contract uh, transferring an interest in land, 
if you've had real property, you understand that's, that there are other interests that you can have in land besides just owning the land, right? Sure, if I'm selling you property, if I'm selling you real property, that has to be in writing. Uh, but if I'm leasing you real property, that's an interest in land. A mortgage is an interest in land. An easement, a restrictive covenant, an option to buy real estate, those are interests in land. Um, and those, those in order to be enforceable, those all need to be in writing, okay? So anytime you're transferring an interest in land, um, then the contract, in order to sta satisfy the statute of frauds, uh, then the contract has to be in writing. All right, so um, what about if um, I hire a builder to build a brand new house on my piece of property? That involves land, right? No, does not have to be in writing because... The contractor is not transferring any interest in land to me. He's just building the house on the land, right? He's just doing something to improve the land. If you're not transferring an interest in the property, then the contract does not have to be in writing, okay? So if I'm, if I'm hiring you to plant my crops, if I'm hiring you to build my house, if I'm hiring you to tear down a barn or dig a ditch, right? Then I'm not transferring you an interest in property. You're not transferring an interest in, in property to me. Uh, that would not have to be in writing. Uh, but a sale, a lease, a mortgage, an easement, restrictive covenants, those kind of things, in order to be enforceable, they have to be in writing. Uh, you can put an asterisk next to the lease, at least in Texas and in many other states. Um, lease, as it turns out, um, often come with an exception that if the lease is for a period of less uh, one year or less, um, then uh, then the lease doesn't necessarily have to be in writing. Okay, and check your state because some year it's a year or less doesn't have to be in writing, meaning that if it's 365 days, it doesn't have to be in writing. Some states are one year or more, meaning that if it's 365 days, it does have to be in writing. If it's 364 days, it does not. But 365 is that cutoff. So is the cutoff 365, 364, 366? Check your statute in your state to see if they even have that exception. Uh, but Texas, for instance, has, a, has an exception that leases that are for less than one year don't have to be in writing. Um, why do we do that? Why, why does that make sense? Many of you may have, have leased an apartment for one year. Uh, your lease was in writing. Even if you leased an apartment for six months, your lease was probably in writing. Why would we have that exception? Well, um, how about this? What if you want to get married? What if you want to have a birthday party? What if you're throwing a quinceanera, right? And you want to rent, you want to lease um, a, a venue for the night. Does that lease have to be in writing? Um, no, no, that's, that, that's still a lease. Still, revolves, uh, still involves real property, rights to use real property. Uh, but that lease would not have to be in writing, at least in Texas, because we have that one year exception, right? Leases of less than a year uh, don't have to be in writing. Um, so be aware that uh, that, that lease uh, comes with an asterisk when it comes to my legs. Otherwise, M, contracts in anticipation of marriage. Y, contracts that cannot be completed within one year, okay? A year and a day has to be in writing. And L, contracts involving land, contracts involving the transfer of an interest in land or in real property, okay? That's my legs. Um, e is a little tricky. E stands for estates, okay? But we're gonna skip this one because um, it's basically covered by S. Um, the uh, E doesn't mean that any contract with an estate has to be in writing. E only means that, that um, if you've taken wills and estates yet, uh, then you will be familiar with, uh, with probate courts appointing a personal representative of the estate, all right? The, the, the personal representative of the estate, usually we call that an executor or administrator, um, and they have the, the authority to enter into contracts on behalf of the estate. But if you enter into a contract with an executor on behalf of the estate and the contract is breached, then all you can do is sue the estate. You can't typically sue the executor or the administrator, right? You can only sue the estate. And if the estate doesn't have any assets, then you're out of luck. Um, but occasionally people don't want to deal with the estate or they don't, they don't trust the estate. They don't think the estate has enough assets. And, and so they say, okay, I'll enter into this contract with the estate, but only if the executor or the administrator um, guarantees the contract, right? Um, they guarantee that I can sue them if, uh, if the estate's not good for it. 
Um, that is the only situation where E applies, where the administrator or the executor agrees uh, to be liable for a potential uh, estate debt. And in that situation, um, then the contract would have to be in writing, uh, signed by that executor or administrator in order to be enforceable. Um, and in that situation, that's also pretty much covered by S. Um, so we're not going to worry too much about memorizing E. Um, but if we take E out, then we don't have my legs anymore. We just have my legs. Um, so E is for estates. But remember, that's the one that you, you probably don't need to memorize um, because it's, it's mostly covered by S. Okay. Um, what about G? G stands for goods. Contracts for the sale of goods typically have to be in writing. Um, but it's not that it's not that broad. Contracts for the sale of goods for five hundred dollars or more. Okay, um, contracts for the sale of goods of five hundred dollars or more have to be in writing in order to be enforceable. So, um, as long as the contract is for less than five hundred bucks, doesn't need to be in writing. If the contract is for more than five hundred dollars, uh, then in order to satisfy the statute of frauds, you have to have a writing that sets forth the essential terms signed by the party to be charged, all right? Um, that one is also in a different spot. In fact, let me see if I can, um, um, ah, let me see if I can find, um, I know statutes for you. Hang on, I'm sorry. Uh, I should, uh, be able to get to that quicker. Where is it? Um, here we go. Um, all right. Um, I told you earlier that the uh, the statute of frauds, what we call the statute of frauds, you're typically going to find in Texas, you're going to find in uh, chapter 26 of the Business and Commerce Code. And if you look at the part I have highlighted right here, um, it says that a promise or agreement described below um, is only enforceable if it is one in writing and two signed by the person to be charged, right? That's what we've been talking about this whole time with the statute of frauds. And then subsection B as well, which categories, wh which types of agreements uh, have to be in writing in order to be enforceable. And if you start reading, you're going to see that these are starting to look a whole lot like these my legs, right? Like number three right here, an agreement made on consideration of marriage, right? Uh, there's your M. Um, a, uh, um, a, a, a Number six, an agreement which is not to be performed within one year. That's Y, right? Of my legs. Uh, L, uh, a contract for the sale of real estate, right? That's right here, right? Um, um, that one doesn't say, in, in Texas, ours doesn't just say the transfer of any interest in land. We only say the sale uh, of real estate. Um, now, that might be expanded to cover things like um, uh, um, um, easements and those kind of things, but, but, but be careful. Uh, because again, the courts generally narrowly construe the statute of frauds. Uh, but then you'll see next that we add a lease of real estate for longer than one year. So 365 days does not have to be in writing. 364 days does. But again, that falls under that L, right? So M, Y, L, um, even E is in here, right? A um, uh, 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 Number one, a promise made by an executor or administrator to answer out of his own estate uh, for, um, uh, for damage or a debt due. Um, uh, for the decedent or from the estate, right? So there's M-Y-L-E, but where is G? There's no G here, uh, not in the Texas statute of frauds. Uh, so where is it? It is, um, if I can, well, um, there we go. Um, we find it in the UCC, okay? If you go to, if you go to the UCC, remember that's, uh, uh, um, Title one of the Texas Business and Commerce Code, chapter two is, is sales. And if you go to 2.201, now we're in the UCC. And here we're going to see in 2201 that except as otherwise provided, a contract for the sale of goods for the price of $500 or more is not enforceable unless there is some writing sufficient to indicate that a contract for sale has been made and signed by the party against whom enforcement is sought, right? So we have the statute of frauds here that has most of those same categories we've talked about. And then we have 
in the in the uh, Texas version of the Uniform Commercial Code, we have that second that that, that uh, section for G for goods, um, goods for uh, uh, with a cost of five hundred dollars uh, or more. All right. Um, just to point out that sometimes you have to look at more than one statute. All right. Sorry for the um, uh, sorry for the detour there, but let's go back to uh, goods. So uh, in general, contracts for the sale of goods for five hundred dollars or more must be in writing. Again, that is a UCC provision. Uh, Texas incorporates that UCC provision at section 2201 of the Business and Commerce Code, but be aware, um, remember the Uniform Commercial Code is not always uniform. Some states fiddle with the Uniform Commercial Code when they adopt it. Texas has certainly made a bunch of changes uh, to the Uniform Commercial Code before we adopted it, and other states have as well, and they don't always make the same changes. Some states will fiddle with section 2.201. They'll either take it out completely and put it in their own statute of frauds, or in section 2201, they may change that dollar amount. That dollar amount may be higher, maybe $1,000, maybe $5,000, okay? Uh, so be aware um, that if you're, if you're entering into a contract for the sale of goods, um, the UCC may apply. If it's less than $500, if the contract is for less than $500, it's probably not going to be in the UCC and you're probably go, it, it, cool, right? But if it's $500 or more, you need to check your statute and which, which statute do you need to check? Well, in Texas, you need to check section 2201 of the UCC. Um, if it's uh, 500 bucks in Texas, it's going to be covered. Other states, maybe not, uh, but you need to check section 2201 or uh, check their version of their statute of frauds, okay? Um, uh, remember that um, this section, uh, th that the UCC only applies to the sale of goods by or between merchants, okay? So if, um, so, so G, the, 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 the uh, contract for the sale of goods with a value of $500 or more only applies, it only has to be in writing if that sale has at least one merchant, all right? Remember, a merchant is somebody who, whose normal business is to deal in goods of the type. Um, so, um, if you're going to buy a car at a used car dealership, they're definitely a merchant. A car is definitely a good. And if you're paying more than $500 for the car, then that contract needs to be in writing. Um, if you're buying a car from me, does that, if, if you're buying a car from me for $1,000, does that contract have to be in writing? The answer is no, because even that's a con, even though that's the contract, a uh, contract for the sale of goods with a value in in excess of $500, remember the UCC doesn't apply to a sale of goods between me and you because neither one of us are merchants, all right? So that's a little technical uh, twist on the G in my legs. A G stands for the sale of goods for $500 or more, but it only applies if the UCC applies, if it is a transaction by or between merchants, okay? Um, so that's a little tricky. Um, I don't know that I would uh, would test you on something that subtle, um, but be aware of it, right? That that separates uh, the people who really understand the UCC from the people who are just memorizing things and getting by. Um, that is also a nuance that's in Texas law. Um, in other states, if they have G, if they have sale of goods in their statute of frauds, um, well, then it may apply to every sale of goods, not just to uh, cases where the UCC applies, all right? Uh, we don't have a separate section in our statute of frauds that deals with the sale of goods. So the only place we can find that provision in Texas is in the UCC. Therefore, it only applies if the UCC applies. Um, also be aware that the UCC follows the law that we've talked about earlier and specifically says that even if there's no contract at the time, uh, that a subsequent writing or a subsequent acknowledgement um, would be enough to satisfy the statute of frauds. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, what about S? We're almost at the end of my legs. M, remember, contracts in anticipation of marriage. Y, contracts that cannot be performed within one year. L, contracts involving the transfer of an interest in land or real estate. E, stands for estates. That's the one that's a little bit funny, so you don't really need to memorize that one because we're going to talk about it when we get to S, but we need the vowel to make the words work. G, is for a, a contract for the sale of goods over $500. Put an asterisk next to that because in Texas, it only applies if the UCC applies. And that brings us to S. S stands for surety agreements. What is a surety agreement? 
a surety agreement is a promise to answer for the debts of another, okay? That is a surety agreement. If somebody else doesn't pay, then I will pay, okay? Um, surety agreements under the statute of frauds must be in writing in order to be enforceable. So, um, um, if you're going to be a surety, um, then in order for the, uh, the, the person who's loaning the money, in order for them to come after you, uh, if the other side, if the, uh, the original party doesn't pay, um, then they are going to need that contract to be in writing and to be signed by you, all right? Um, but be aware. Uh, there is a difference between a co-signer um, and a guarantor. A guarantor is a surety. A guarantor is someone who says, if they don't pay, then I will pay, right? Um, if they don't pay first, right? That is a prerequisite to liability against me for as a guarantor. First, you got to see if the original party doesn't pay. If they don't pay, then I will pay, right? That's a guarantee. That's a surety ship agreement. A co-signer is different. A co-signer is where both parties are primarily liable on the debt at the same time. They co-sign, right? They signed it together. So if um, you ever had to have your parents or your grandparents or a friend or somebody co-sign on a lease uh, for an apartment, right? Or co-sign on a mortgage to buy a house or co-sign on a car note, be aware that that doesn't fall into the statute of frauds. At least it doesn't fall into the statute of frauds under the S category because that's not a surety arrangement. With a co-signer, both parties are borrowing the money. Both parties are borrowing the money to buy the car. Both parties are borrowing the money to buy the house. Both parties are entering into the lease. And so both parties are responsible, are responsible for the money. And if the lease doesn't get paid, then the apartment can sue you or they can sue your co-signer because you're, you both sign together, right? If, uh, if the car payment doesn't get made, the, lease, the, the, the lending company can sue you or they can sue your co-signer because you're both primarily liable for that debt, right? Um, co-signers are not guarantors, right? They are equally liable uh, with the original party. And so co-signing agreements typically don't fall under S in the statute of frauds. Uh, that may be a little interesting there. Um, so a surety ship um, is one where somebody is not primarily liable on the debt. They're secondarily liable on the debt. They're only liable if the original party breaches or defaults or doesn't pay, okay? Um, and if you have an agreement like that, then in order for it to be enforceable, it must be in writing and it must be signed by the guarantor or by the surety, all right? Um, which brings us back around to a time to talk about that E. Um, e is for uh, executors, uh, executor or estates, uh, executors or administrators or personal representative of estates. They fall into this category as S. If they sign on as a guarantor, if they sign on as a surety that they will be personally liable, they will guarantee an estate obligation or an estate debt, or they will guarantee a debt of the decedent, the, the testator, the person who passed away. Um, if they agree to to um, uh, to uh, uh, to guarantee some debt um, that the decedent entered into before they passed, those have to be in writing. Okay, but essentially that's just a surety ship agreement. All right. Um, so the categories uh, to which the statute of frauds apply are covered by that mnemonic device: my legs, M Y L E G S, marriage, year, land. Estates, maybe we need to remember, G is for goods, over 500 bucks, and S is surety ship arrangements, all right? My legs. Um, we talked about uh, uh, this already, uh, and, and give me just a couple more minutes and then we'll be done. Uh, remember um, that something may be accepted from the statute of frauds, or, or we may find that the statute of frauds has been satisfied um, if a party subsequently acknowledges the agreement, what would that look like? Well, it could be a subsequent writing, right? Um, or it could even be testimony under oath. Um, if you sue somebody and you send them interrogatories and you say, hey, did you enter into this agreement with me? And they say, yes, right? Or you send them a request for admission, admit that you entered into this agreement and they, uh, and they admit it. 
That's enough. That's sufficient. That is a sufficient acknowledgement to satisfy the statute of frauds. It's in writing. It contains the essential terms. Um, and typically those are signed by the party to be charged. Um, so that's that subsequent acknowledgement. Even if it's not something like, uh, um, you know, six months later, they send you an email just to confirm that we've entered into the contract. That would be an acknowledgement. Um, but even discovery in a lawsuit um, could be an acknowledgement. So if somebody pleads the statute of frauds, the very first as an affirmative defense, remember it's an affirmative defense, the, the defendant has to plead it. Um, and if they plead the statute of frauds, probably the very first thing you should do is send them discovery requests, send them a, uh, a, a an interrogatory or a request for admission and say, admit or deny that you entered into this agreement with me. And if they say, I admit it, um, then guess what? They've just they've just ruined their statute of frauds defense because now you have an acknowledgement, all right? Uh, there's another way to take something out of the statute of frauds typically, and that's by something called partial performance, okay? Partial performance, where, where one party has already performed or already started to perform their part of the contract. Um, what does this mean and why would this why would this take a, an agreement out of the statute of frauds? Well, uh, think about it. Remember, at the very beginning, we talked about what is the purpose of the statute of frauds. The purpose of the statute of frauds is not to prevent fraud generally, right? We talked about that weeks ago. Um, different elements for fraud. The purpose of the statute of frauds is to prevent people from coming to court and claiming there was an agreement that didn't really exist, all right? Um, but if somebody has already started to perform on the contract, then that's some evidence that would help satisfy the court um, that, the, uh, that the contract really existed, right? This guy wouldn't have started doing this if there wasn't a contract. Um, and so sometimes partial performance is enough to take something out of the statute of frauds. In other words, courts find that as an exception. Um, okay, there wasn't a writing, but one of the parties started to perform, they've already, uh, they've already paid the money or they've already begun construction, right? They wouldn't have done that if they didn't have a contract. And so some courts will find that partial performance to be an exception to the statute of frauds. Okay, you didn't have a writing, but one of the parties has already performed or has already started to perform. Therefore, that's an exception. We're not going to apply the statute of frauds. Um, and remember that we always have those equitable remedies as well, right? Even if the court says, well, um, partial performance isn't enough or hasn't gone far enough, but I'm going to apply a, a quantum merit remedy or, or I'm going to apply a promissory estoppel remedy. Uh, you always have those as well. Um, there's also an exception under the UCC, an exception for specially manufactured goods. If we went back and looked at section 2201, um, uh, the UCC says that exception to that writing requirement is where... Um, is, and this is, is probably also akin to a partial performance, is where one party has begun to manufacture specially manufactured goods, all right? Um, and why is that? Well, because that, that tends to, um, to prove that there was some kind of contract that existed, right? Um, so if, um, if, Home Depot, um, if Home Depot contracts with GE to buy refrigerators, um, that's a, a contract for the sale of goods over 500 bucks. We definitely have two merchants there, right? So the UCC applies um, and it's not in writing. Um, and GE says, well, hey, you know, we want to enforce this because we already started making the refrigerators. Are those specially manufactured goods? No, GE is always making refrigerators, right? Um, and so the fact that they just made some more refrigerators doesn't satisfy that requirement. Um, but let's say wall, uh, uh, let's say Home Depot wants to sell some specially branded uh, uh, Home Depot refrigerators, right? They're not going to say GE on the front. We want you to put a Home Depot label on them and we want you to build them a little bit different. Maybe once you paint them orange, right? We're going to have these Home Depot orange refrigerators. Is that something GE makes? No, that's a special order. That's something they're going to have to specially manufacture for Home Depot. And if GE starts to manufacture those specially ordered goods, right, that only satisfy Home Depot's requirements, um, then there's an exception to the UCC that says that may be sufficient to take it out of the statute of frauds, okay? Um, another example might be something like um, car parts, right? Uh, your um, uh, Ford um, contracts with a company to build taillights for the Ford Fusion, right? That's the only car it'll fit. Uh, these 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 taillights only fit a Ford Fusion. They can't fit anything else. 
um, that may be specially manufactured goods, right? We can't sell these to anybody else. Uh, why would we have started making these if we didn't have a contract with Ford? So those, those specially manufactured goods uh, may be an exception uh, to the UCC. Uh, to the UCC portion of the statute of frauds. So remember that would only apply to the sale of goods for more than $500 of buyer between merchants. An exception to that uh, the needing to be in writing uh, would be if this was a contract for specially manufactured goods and the manufacturer had already started to make them. All right. So uh, statute of frauds, certain contracts in a nutshell, certain contracts have to be in writing in order to be enforceable. Which contracts? My legs. Contracts in anticipation of marriage, M. Uh, contracts that can't be completed within one year, Y. L is for land, a contract for the transfer of an interest in land, a sale or a lease typically, um, L. E is for estates. We don't really need to remember that one. G is for that sale of goods in excess of $500. In some states, applies to everything. In other states, it only applies if the UCC applies. Texas is one of those states. Uh, but in general, remember that a contract for the sale of goods in excess of $500 may be covered by the statute of fraud. So you need to check, see if you fit into that narrow category in Texas uh, that is not covered by the UCC, um, or if your state even has that, that kind of nuanced difference, right? And then S, my legs, is for surety ship agreements. That's where a guarantor guarantees somebody else's debt, where they're, they're secondarily liable if the first person doesn't pay. Um, so M-Y-L-E-G-S, marriage, year, land, estates, uh, goods, and surety ship, my legs, all right? Uh, may sound funny, but if you can remember my legs, um, then you can probably remember all of the categories uh, uh, that typically fall under the statute of frauds. Now, remember, the statute of frauds is a real statute. Every state has one. Every state is a little bit different, and they can add some extra things, like in Texas, um, it's not just any transfer in land, it's only a sale of land. Um, and it's only leases of land if they're more than a year. Um, so Texas has a little nuance there. Um, Texas also adds a couple of things, like we add some stuff about oil and gas leases, right? Other states don't have oil and gas. They don't care about oil and gas. They don't have that in their statute of frauds. Um, so just remember, statute of frauds, typically a state law. So it's going to be a little bit different by every state. Always check your statute. But in general, uh, the main categories are my legs. Um, they say if you repeat something three times, the students will remember it. I'm sure we've got more than three times now, uh, but just to make sure, marriage, year, land, estates, goods, surety ship. All right, if you can remember that, you can remember the statute of frauds. Um, if you have any questions, give me a call, shoot me an email, uh, send me a text, we'll talk about it. Uh, otherwise, you've got a couple of assignments this week. Take a look at them. Uh, let me know if you have any trouble. All right, thanks.